Um, we're going to get the nerd stuff out of the way early here. <laughs> so uh, the first question I have for you is who has a drum key in the pocket? Yes. I see hands. Okay, so I guess the rest of you will be tuning with your teeth. Um, rule number one, if you're a drummer, is to always have a drum key in your pocket. So, I just want to go over for a couple minutes a little bit about kind of my philosophy on how I tune and why I tune. Um, for me, drummers have always sort of been isolated, like you had the real musicians in the band and then you had the drummer. And I've heard that joke a million times and it never really offended me, but it kind of offended me. <laughs> but at the same time, it's kind of true. Um, except for some of those drummers who are also musicians, which that is not me. I cannot play anything else. Uh, I can barely sing. And what I'm really interested in is rhythm. Um, so, but what I've kind of come to, to understand, just for my part in being in a band, is that if you really want to be part of the band and you really want to provide the, the rhythmic foundation for the band, you have to have a little bit of musicality. Um, you can't just be about the math. You kind of have to understand how, how the drums play their part in the music. And so one of the, one of the things that I like to think about drums is that they're not just rhythmic, but they're also a tuned instrument. Um, they make pitches, and the more control we have over what pitches our drums are making, the better that our playing and our sound is going to mesh with the rest of the band. Um, you know, one of the things in a, in a live band situation is you've got eight to ten uh, open mics on a drum kit. That's about half the total inputs for, uh, for the band. And so if you're making two dozen horrible sounds out of your drums, it's going to be very difficult for your sound guy to, to make anything of you and the rest of the band. And so my goal is always to focus my sound to make it as pure and simple as possible because that makes a lot more room in the mix for guitars and vocals and all those other things that you know that the audience will will pay more attention to and so my goal as a drummer and the way that I tune my drums is to almost make make it so that people don't think about it you know that the foundations there that they walk away going wow that was that sounded awesome it was punchy it rocked my face off and that was great. I don't know why, but I know it was awesome. And so, you know, I found just playing in lots of different venues that sound guys will love you if you can walk in there and make the house drum kits sound better than what they've been struggling with for the rest of the sound check. And so, you know, if I can walk in there and tweak a couple things and make that drum kit sound better, he's going to be more into my band than the other bands that are playing that night. And that's good, that's good for my band, and it's good for the audience, and it's good for the club. So that's kind of why I pay as much attention to it as I do. I probably will take it to a much more extreme level than some other people, and that's okay. There is not a right or wrong way to do tuning. It's very subjective. What I want to talk about is just a couple of, of things that are helpful regardless of how you end up tuning, how you get to your your goal. So the first, the first thing is in changing a head and putting a new head on, it's very, very important how you seat the head on the drum. Um, if you don't get that right, you're going to fight that head until you take it back off. And that's no fun. I've had heads where I, I didn't do it correctly and I hated, the, I hated the drum, I hated the head, I hated playing for the entire time that that head was on the drum. So it's, it's, I take as much time up front as I need to make sure that that thing is, is the way that it needs to be. So what I'm going to do is just run through that quickly. Um, by the way, today's event is sponsored by Remo, um, which is good because I use them anyway. Um, there are other companies that make heads that are equally um, as good in quality. Uh, I found different brands um, have wildly different sound textures and things like that. I like Remo because I think that they're, it's a very musical sound. Um, some of the other brands sound a little bit flatter and plasticky. Um, 
I, I think, like Evans, they're very consistent. Their sound is identical from head to head, um, as far as you know, in the same the same head. They they sound really similar, so that's a that's a good thing. Um, but I just like the way a Reno head feels. I like the way that it sounds. It just feels I don't know more musical to me. I don't know how to describe that better than that. So when I whenever I take a head off of a drum, I always check all of the the screws and things on the inside, just because we hit it a lot, it vibrates a lot, those things work loose over time, so I just take that opportunity to, to do that. Um, I'll take my fingers on the bearing edge and just make sure that I clean any dust off of it, because all those things can affect the way the head sits on there. And then I'll pick it up and just blow the dust out of it. Um, I'm kind of anal about this, but I will take the label on the head and I'll put it where the label on the drum is. Um, it doesn't matter for the sound, but for me, I try to take care of every detail that I can just as a habit. Because once you start like not caring about this thing, then you start not caring about this thing and on and on, and then after a while you're just kind of throwing things together. So that's just my personal craziness. Um, the other thing I'll do is take my finger and just run it around. I don't know if you've ever noticed how much dust and stick chips and things collect in there. You want to get all that out of there so that you have clean metal against the, the hoop on the head and all that kind of stuff. So then I'll start each lug just with my fingers to get it started. I have a couple time-saving tips or tricks that I do. Um, they're not required. I'm going to do them here because it's going to get me up and running a little bit faster. I change a lot of heads, and the faster I can get through this process, the better because I don't really enjoy it. Um, when I do this, I just make sure that I stop the lug before it gets to the hoop because I don't want to accidentally tighten it down. Um, it's very easy to make a mistake at the beginning of a head, and if you, if you tighten it off-center, you'll never get it back. And I've had heads before where I messed it up and tried tuning it, it wouldn't tune, and I just took it off and threw it away. And that gets expensive, so you don't want to do that. So what I will do here is I'll grab the lug underneath and, the, and up here and I'll pinch it. And then I get an idea that I'm kind of seating the head evenly. Um, when you change a head on a 10 lug drum, Eight's nice because you can kind of do the cross thing. With 10, it's, I'm basically doing a single across and then a double this way to kind of get it set. Um, die cast hoops and flanged hoops work differently. Uh, die cast is much stiffer and it'll kind of, one lug will affect the next lug more than it does on a flange hoop. So then I'm basically just trying to get these to where I feel like they're roughly the same tension around the drum. Uh, on a Remo head, not so much their newer ones like the, the Vintage Ambassadors and the Vintage Emperors and like the X heads, um, you hear the cracking and popping. That happens on their older heads, like some of the more classic ones. I don't know why. I like to get all of that out right off the bat because otherwise, you tune it up the first time you hit it, one of the it'll pop somewhere, and then that lug will just detune, and then you got to do the whole thing all over again. So I'm trying to get that initial stretch out of it, get rid of all the cracking and popping, and then the first thing I'll do is go around the drum and just kind of one of my one of my influences with this is a guy named Bob Gatson. He's a uh, He's a little bit odd. He's more uh, anal retentive than I am. 
And the one thing I learned from him that's really important is the idea of being musical is to sing the note that you're hearing, but to sing the note that you want to get to also. Um, <clears throat> there is something that happens. I have a, I keep a piano app on my phone. Uh, and I can, I can play the note on the drum and then I hit the drum and I can't really hear it. But if I sing it, then I can hear it. So there's something about, there's something in your brain that when you sing the note, it tunes your ear. And so when I hear people say like, oh, I don't have a good ear or I can't hear pitches, usually what I tell them is then sing it. So like if I, I can't sing, but I can sing good enough to tune a drum. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to sing that. But that's an E. If I'm going for an E, I want to sing that E. You know, if I... That's an E flat. Um, once I know that, just having that knowledge in my head of where the drum is at, it gives me an idea then where, where I need to go to on the piano. So... <clears throat> I tune to notes. There are guys that don't, and that's a perfectly legitimate way of doing it. I tune to notes because it makes it repeatable for me. Like I can get the same result every single time because I have, I have this telling me where I need to get to and I know when it's right. So one of my time-saving things is attention watch. Um, there's a drum dial, they basically work the same way. The only thing I use this for is the initial seating of the head. Um, the numbers on these dials don't mean anything because it's not really calibrated to anything in particular. And all it tells me is I had this lug here a little bit tighter than the rest of them. So it's basically in the ballpark at this point. And what I would do from this point then is just to go around quarter turns. Um, I'm not totally like that whole like star pattern and it's numbered and you, I, it's so confusing to me. I just don't even bother with it the most of the time. So I'll go, I'll tune across, but I'll just kind of work my way around the drum. I don't do the, you know, the, I don't even know how to do it. Um, some guys will actually write the numbers on the head so that when they tune, they can go through the sequence. I just don't find it all that important um, because generally, like from this point, I'm going to tune it up fairly quickly because I need to get up to a, a particular pitch. But after a while, you're, you're dealing with such small turns that I just work my way around the drum. And I think that's fine. I've never had a problem with it. Um, I'm sure that there's somebody in the world that would tell me I'm crazy, and they may be right. Uh, so that's kind of how I get the head ready to go. So at this point, you know, then I would start working with getting it up to the exact pitch that I want. Um, a trick for the bottom head when you're tuning, uh, some of you may already know this, is to pull the snares up and take a stick and lay it across there. And then you can, you can tune that head without the snares being a problem. So you don't have to do the thing where you're holding the drum upside down so the snares hang off of it and all that kind of stuff. And you don't have to remove the snares. Um, Pure Sound has those awesome snare wires now. It has the little clip that you pull out and you can pull the snare wires right off the drum. That's the greatest thing ever in the history of mankind, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I was skeptical when it first came out, but I tried it and I thought it was awesome. So what I'm gonna do is just show you some other drums that I already have tuned up. Um, so this, Can you hear that? So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to sing that note. It's a C. Um, I find that I generally like my snare drums tuned on the top to a tension that feels comfortable to me for playing. So the top head to me is more about the feel of the drum because when you're driving a stick into the head like every two beats for an hour and a half. If that thing's super tight, you're just gonna wear your arm out. And also, if it's really loose, you're gonna get hand cramps from working the stick so much to get the rebound that you want. So for me, I'm always like, 
where does this feel right? And I just find on the heads that I use, on the drums that I use, generally in the B, C, D area, in uh, that'd be the fourth octave, is kind of where I want it. Um, then I do different things with the bottom depending on what type of sound I want. If you want a really sharp crack out of the drum, then you'll want to tune the bottom head up pretty high, like pretty super tight, which is how that other snare drum is. It's I have that. That's a that's at a G over the C on top, so it's like a third or whatever it is higher. Um, on this drum, because it's a shallower drum, I'm trying to get a little bit fatter sound out of it, so I don't have the top or the bottom head tuned up as high. It's tuned to an E. So it's still higher than the top head, but not a ton. And then what I'm getting out of that is a... So it has that, the high end a little bit, but there's a little more fatness to it where you're getting some low end, so... Um, I really, really love this drum. I have a, a six and a half, that's basically the same thing. Um, so with snare drums, a snare drum basically has the widest tuning range of any of your drums. You know, you can get a kick drum sounds good in a fairly narrow range. Oops. Um, toms are probably the narrowest. The, it's really easy to make a tom sound bad. Um, it's not as easy to make it sound good. Uh, the whole thing that DW says, they, they write the note on the inside of the shell that, you know, this shell note is whatever it is. Um, you can do that with any drum because all they do is pick the shell up and go and listen to that and they figure out what note that is. And they do it without, I think they do it without any hardware or, sh or heads or anything on it. It's just the shell. Um, but if you dampen the heads, this is a D. It's just a hair below a D, but that's that's close enough. And all that I'm not going to tune it necessarily to that note, but that tells me I got to be somewhere around there. You know, I got to be within like a step and a half or two steps of that note. So I can tune it down to a C. I can tune it up to an E. But if I go any further than that. The drum's just not going to sound good because it's not going to resonate well. Because generally what you want out of a tom is the resonance. You know, you get the attack out of the shell, but you want the resonance. So the tom sounds fat and you have that, that kind of thing. So I did tune this to a D. Um, one thing that when you have a... If you tune the two heads exactly the same pitch, you'll get a really fat sound that'll ring forever. Um, that's, that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. Um, most sound guys are gonna tell you that they want the drum to happen and go away because that's what helps them in a live environment um, achieve what they're, what they're trying to get. So if your drums happen and they just ring and ring and ring, everybody's gonna hate you. Um, so one thing that you can do is the bottom head, instead of having it tuned the same, is just tune it up a half step. Alright, I went up a whole step, but that'll be fine. So, it still rings when you're real close, but the, the, the meat of the sound is right up front. And it just, it tails off a lot quicker. Um, and then I do, some guys use moon gel. I don't like moon gel because it, because it leaves the gooey stuff on the head and it gets on your sticks and it gets on your fingers and then it gets on your cymbals and then it gets on everything and then it's just gross. <laughs> so I use tape. Um, I will take a piece of tape. You've probably all seen this. And I'll just take a little fold in it. Like that, stick it on the drum. Uh, sometimes I'll rip it in half to make it thinner. Like on a smaller drum, you don't want it too big where it comes out into the playing area of the head. I will always put it between two lugs, not at a lug, because that way, when I'm tuning, I can still tap in front of that lug and not be on the tape on the head. Um, so, that's 
that's about it. I, I'm going to take some questions here in a minute, and I will also be available the rest of the day. I'm trying to hit some of the basics here so that you guys have an idea. But if you have more, more questions or more technical questions or you're wondering about us, Um, so, I'm just I think that's it um, for the for these. Um,